Now, what about knee pads? I'm, I'm, I'm like reticent to even bring this up because prepare ourselves for the Instagram controversy to follow. But with regards to style, um, how do you feel about using knee pads, especially if they hadn't been used on the first ascent? I feel like if the first ascent of the route has been done without knee pad, then that's the style you should try to repeat it in. And um, I've just noticed that lots of people, they just want to take the grade you know, but they don't want to put in enough effort. So that's always a, a big problem. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think, you know, I've, I've this debate has been, you know, raging for, for years now, kind of the knee pad. And some say, well, if you take away knee pads, why not take away modern shoes or chalk and that kind of thing. But I do feel like the way you framed it right there is actually an incredibly clear way to look at it. I mean, and is it, the, still, is it the pad that's the issue? Not the not of taking a knee bar, but it's the it's the rubber, the layer of rubber. The layer of rubber, exactly. Because very often, I mean, very often I feel like there are knee bars that you can only do with a knee pad, or you can only get the rest with a knee pad. Like if you only have your bare knees or you know your pants, you're not going to be able to use the same knee bar. That's um, got it. But those are two different things altogether, I would say. I mean, sometimes there is just a knee bar that you just end up not seeing and it would make it easier even without a knee pad. Then uh, it just it's just obvious the first ascender, well, either he didn't spend enough time or he chose to not use it or he just didn't see it. The grade needs to be changed. I feel sometimes it's a bit of a gray area when the first ascend was, is done without knee pad and somebody uses a knee pad, should the grade be changed? Yes or no? That depends. I think everybody will have a different opinion on that. My opinion is that people should just try to repeat it the same way that the first center did. Obviously, most people don't want to do that. That's fine. And I guess then the route, in some cases, needs to be downgraded. But interestingly, with classical routes, um, I feel like people are more willing to repeat it in the style it's been put up. So I, I, I'd like to take a funny example, for example, Hubble. You know, it used to be uh, the fir world's first 14C in the UK, in England, um, at the Craig Raven Tour. Was it Ben and, Moon that put that up? Yeah, Ben Moon. When was it? Was it in 89? I believe it was, was in 89. The, that sounds right. Or uh, 90, uh, 89, something like that, like a long while ago. And obviously back then, nobody used knee pads. And you could argue nobody used good shoes back then either. But the nature of the route is that it has like little roofs. So technically... Probably if you have the right length, length of leg and you use two knee pads, you could probably find a sneaky way here to avoid doing the hard moves. And then it might be only, you know, 14B, so 8C. So a grade easier or maybe two grades easier than what it is now. Should Hubble be downgraded now just because somebody found a sneaky way with a knee pad that maybe works only for him because he's got the right length of legs? Or should it not be downgraded? Hmm. And that's, I feel like that's um, something the climbing world doesn't have an answer to. And there's no consensus about that. I wonder, I mean, there might be a consensus in a few years, but for now, that's a gray area. And it always comes down to the climber who repeats it with or without knee pad, you know, with a new beta that he found with the old beta used. It just comes down to him being honest. Yeah, and I think you've been very gracious in that. Just to wrap this up, because we don't—it's not a whole show about about knee pads. But I am fascinated with this, and I, I agree that it is the the guarantee is that regardless of where you fall in the climbing world on this, you will have an opinion. And so I think it's you know it, it is interesting, and probably just needs a little bit more time for there to become a consensus. Uh, but I think you've been incredibly gracious looking at bibliography, for example, and the original grade you gave of that and then the accepting a potential downgrade. But really, you're only talking about two climbers here. And, you know, at what point is a grade kind of considered settled? Is it five climbers? Is it 10 climbers? There's only a few people in the whole world that climb at your level. So um, it, it becomes even harder to pin down, I think, when we're talking about, you know, the nine A's, nine B's, nine C's of the world, because there's just not that many people who are climbing them. Yeah, I mean, it depends. I feel like in the future, there will be obviously loads more people climbing those grades. Well, I know that whenever I send um, something that's at my limit, I immediately go online and grade it the hardest grade possible so that it preserves that grade so I don't get downgraded in the future. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of that happening in the 
in the mid five twelve uh, area at the Red River Gorge. Uh, well, good man. I appreciate your perspective on that. It's um, it's just really refreshing to be able to have uh, you know a totally candid conversation about grades, which at the end of the day are completely subjective. And we don't climb grades; we climb roots, we climb lines, we we climb problems. You know, so it's it's almost pointless anyway. Um, when exactly. you think about it, I mean, it's such so fascinating to talk about and so useless too. And I think that's that's kind of the beauty of it. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, it's good. It just did something to keep us uh, busy when we're not training our fingers. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> how do you tackle a route tactically that you might need to spend more time on than a quick send? I, I think the tactics are definitely different. If I know that I can do something quickly, it doesn't take up as much headspace, you know. Obviously, I'm still going to prepare for it and I will invest time and effort to still make sure that I climb it quickly and that doesn't end up being like nemesis. But when I uh, try something that I know will require, you know, more time, more effort, then I usually, I tend to specifically trade for those things. I usually then do trips to check out the route, to check out the move, see what it requires, see how I need to be to be able to climb it. And then I would, I kind, I kind of plan multiple trips to go to the same destination to make sure that I don't end up spending, you know, weeks and weeks in a row on the same, on the same route, just because that usually makes, well, the body weak also. If you spend too much time on one certain thing, I think you take steps back in your, in your fitness. So, um, yeah, then I would usually, uh, and, and the thing, I think the biggest difference is it would just occupy my mind much more. I, I can remember so much uh, B15 in Bishop. Um, I, I checked it out and I couldn't do it this, the one trip and I, I almost couldn't sleep at night anymore. So I made sure to train for six weeks and then fly back there to get it done. And obviously that's something you can't always do if you have a project for multiple months or years. So you need to actually be patient, you need to learn how to take your mind off of projects, you know, in your times while you're training between then obviously you need to get into the right headspace when you go end up being at your project and when you're trying. That lucid dreaming is just such a beautiful line. And I mean, the, the, the swing, like the feet cut swing where you're coming out and you're holding on to what look like, you know, dime edges, tiny little arrowhead, you know, kind of pinch crimp there. It's absolutely stunning. I mean, it's, I think it's, I'm pretty sure that's the image that's on the cover of Eric Hurst's Training for Climbing book is like where you're swinging out. It's totally gnarly. There's incredible style to that climb. And you've talked about style. Style matters. Um, and I'm curious to know where that came from. What climbing a route with style means? Yeah, I think that is, for me, lucid dreaming is, the definition of an amazing boulder problem. You sit down on the ground, you do a four hard moves, and then a kind of a high top out, but at the end you're standing on a huge boulder and there's not much trickery to it. It's kind of straightforward. The bottom moves, the hard four moves, very, very straightforward. And there's no, heel no looks. knee pads involved, no knee no no heel looks, no knee pads. Uh it just feels like pure climbing and that's something always intrigued me and that's something I always put a lot of value in and for me climbing something in good style usually is that I mean a friend of mine kind of took it to the extreme for example if he would um, be climbing on a route and his foot would pop or he would take a swing like an uncontrolled swing he would hold the swing but just because in his eyes it didn't look good that his foot popped you know he would just jump off and let go because he didn't want to climb it that way Obviously, that's not uh, as extreme as I would go, especially not if you're, you know, sending a hard route that you've invested lots of time in. You're not going to just, you know, jump off the top because the foot pops. 